Amen. Lawson, thank you, young man. You did a good job. I think he reads twice as good as I do. I don't know. He's been practicing. Uh, praise the Lord. So this morning we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And as you notice, we read it there in verses 22. Look at that with me, please. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It says there is no law. When you're filled with God's Holy Spirit and you begin to grow spiritually, this is what we can look for. This is how we can measure ourselves. This is what we should expect of ourselves. These things come from God. He's talking about a supernatural love. He's talking about a supernatural meekness, not just what we can do on our own, but we need God's help in us, working it out through us as we're filled with the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 24, I want you to look at this, he says, And they that are, are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. We live in a time where people are very lustful and they, they're affectionate toward fleshly things. They love the sensual things. So if we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we truly want to grow in our spiritual abilities, the fruit that comes out of our life. There are many, word, many applications of the word fruit in the Bible. Uh, the fruit of the womb is His reward. That's when two people come together in marriage and they reproduce. There is fruit that comes from a tree. Well, when the Holy Spirit moves inside of you by faith, that spirit, as much as you'll allow it to grow, will begin to show off some spiritual fruit that will become evident to other people so they see the benefit of the Holy Spirit. Not everybody has the Holy Spirit. Many are not saved. So here he gives us this warning. In verse 24 he says, If we're Christ, we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're saved. He said, You should crucify your flesh and your lust. In other words, you should put to death that old man, that old desire, all the stuff that you wanted to do. Oftentimes, if you want to know what the right way to do something is, sometimes you can learn by doing it wrong first. I've heard that when you work at a bank, you work with the authentic $100 bills all day. When you touch a fraud, a forgery, you're like, wait a minute, something's not right. I don't know what it is yet, but something's not right. Well, much the same way. Uh, now, it's interesting. I had the opportunity to work with some folks this week. Uh, Lawson that just read for us. We had the opportunity to build some picnic tables. And Lawson, I figured, hey, he's a pretty smart guy. We're going to do it without reading the instructions. <laughs> so we got to build two picnic tables four times. Now, I tell you, the first one, we did it three times until we got it right. The second one, man, it took no time at all. We did it right the first time, didn't we? Now, I know that we were willingly ignorant as we ignored the instructions, and we did things our own way, and we discovered a series of mistakes where we lost time and we had to redo things. Wasn't that just life in general, or especially the Christian life? Some people just won't read the instructions and see what God said. Well, He tells us we should have fruit of the Spirit, but right before He says that, He warns us what the other fruit looks like. He says, here's how you don't want to live because you'll ruin your life. Take a step back in Galatians 5, look at verse number 15. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, so we're commanded to walk in the Spirit, and if we do that, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says in verse 17, The flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would do. Do you understand what he's saying? When you're walking in the flesh, everything that you want to do for you is the exact opposite of what God wants you to do for Him. A hundred percent opposed. These things are exactly the opposite of each other. He says in verse 18, But 
if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. You know, when, when he says there is no law with this fruit of the Spirit, when you do these things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, there's no law anywhere that can go against that. But here he says, in verse 18, now the works of the flesh... So wait, I want you to understand, what we're about to see is a contrast. There's the fruit of the Spirit. This is God's will for your life. Before he introduces it, he says, here's what you don't want to do. This is the works of the flesh. If you are left to yourself without God's help, with no spirit involved in your life, you will probably do some horrible, horrible things in your time. So he says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, uh, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. It's interesting when he starts out this list, he gives you four sexual sins in the flesh that deal with just how people want to live against God. I want you to understand something before, before we go into the fruit of the Spirit. I want to warn you about the damage you can do in the flesh. Go to Genesis chapter uh, 3. Go to Genesis chapter 3. As you're going there, allow me to read something to you. Genesis chapter 3, you're on your way there. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he tells us in verse 16, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? He says, don't you know that your body is God's temple? That's where He wants to live, and therefore with your body you should let Him have it, not your selfish way. He says, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. There's a certain thing called a sin unto death, or in the Old Testament it referred to presumptuous sins. There were certain things you could do with your body where God just says, you know what? You've broken too many of my laws. I'm going to kill you. You understand there are Christians that go home early because they desire the flesh more than they walk in the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, at the end of it, he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now we're talking about spiritual truth in this month, and we've just been warned that what is against the Spirit is what the flesh wants to do. And we're coming into a season here uh, where people are living and looking more like the world than they do like Christians. You understand that you can identify somebody by their outfit, by their wardrobe. You can spot a police officer by the outfit that they put on. You understand, hey, and, and you military folks understand, there's a difference between the uniform that the Navy wears versus the uniform of the National Guard, the uniform of the Marines versus the Army. Uh, a uniform is distinguished and distinct. Our body is a temple for God's Spirit, and our body is supposed to be used for God's glory. We're coming into a season of time where people like to apply situational ethics, and they say, well, this is right and this is wrong, unless the temperature gets real hot, then it's okay for me to take all my clothes off. Is that right? Is that right in God's eyes? We're talking about the love of God in us in the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. That's inside. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, that's how I deal with others. Faith, meekness, temperance, that's how I deal with God. And before he says, here's what you need to know, he says, be warned about your flesh that you want to do these things, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those are sexual sins that you have to get naked to do. And I say these words very delicately because this is very important. We live in a time where Christianity looks just like the world. Wouldn't you call me nuts if you said, hey, we're going to play some basketball, and I showed up in hockey gear. You'd say, that is inappropriate. Well, I'm playing the guard. You know, ah, I got my face mask. You'd say, no, 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 you can't do that. 
Well, if we've been called to be Christians, we ought to look like Christians. Now, I'm not here saying you have to dress like Little House on the Prairie or like the Amish to prove that you're Christian. I, I learned an interesting term this week, clothesline Christianity. There are certain religions that would say whatever's on your clothesline determines whether or not you're saved, and that's false. Don't the Mormons do that? Can't you tell how conservative a Mormon is by their women? Don't the Muslims do the same thing? Can't you tell how conservative a Muslim is because they make a woman cover everything except her eyes? Don't the Catholics, in a sense, do the same way? Certain ones with head coverings and the veil, the whole nine yards. Look, we should live for God. Our body is His temple. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And the Holy, temp the Holy Spirit would like you to garnish your temple appropriately. There are certain parts of your body that the Bible clearly says are nakedness and they belong to God or they belong to your spouse and they should not be displayed publicly. He's warned us many times about this. I want to show you this concept because when he makes the contrast, here's how not to live, and he warns us about adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. Those are sins of nakedness. That's where it begins. But he says, I want you to be filled with the Spirit instead. So these things are the opposite. And I just want to show you this concept that when uh, people get farther away from God, they seem to have less clothing on. And as you get closer to God, you seem to want to put a little more clothing on. There's two different women here in the building uh, that have actually told us the story about well, I got saved, or I began to get closer to the Lord, or whatever it was, and I realized that what I was wearing did not please the Lord. And so I changed my wardrobe because I wanted to honor the Lord with my mind and my body and my spirit and my house and every aspect of my life. In Genesis chapter 3, we see the story where Adam and Eve fell, and the first thing they recognize with sin is nakedness. If you'll look at verse number 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, so now this is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This is what's happening here. Uh, it, she sees it's good for food, mm, that'll taste good, lust of the flesh. It's pleasant to the eyes, that's the uh, lust of the eyes. And it says, a tree to be desired to make one wise. Here's the problem, it's our desires. Do we want to look good to everybody else? Because isn't it, I mean, if we go according to the world's standards, isn't it the cool kids that are dressing inappropriately? We live near the beach and I'm here to tell you as a Christian, you can go to the beach without exposing your body and being naked. But you also should make a plan to go to the beach without exposing your eyes to everyone else's nakedness as well. We have a problem where people want to, the Bible calls the thigh. It talks about everything above the knee is nakedness. It talks about the breasts and the chest. The chest is nakedness. It belongs to the husband. It's perfect in the marriage bed. It's appropriate there, but everywhere else it is not appropriate to display. Here we see they're lusting. They want to be like, well, they want to be something else they're not. Notice it says, desired to make one wise in verse 6. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together to make themselves aprons. Now, uh, if we went to the kitchen and I got an apron and I put it on and that's all that I had on, how many of you would agree that I'm, I'm naked? Uh, an apron does not cover your body. It stops right here and it, it stops right here. Uh, and most of them are open in the back. It's like a hospital gown, right? <laughs> I don't want to go around in public dressed in a hospital gown. He says... And look at this in verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Here's what's happened. They're getting farther away from God. They're getting farther away from God. Many Christians, the farther they get away from spiritual things, it's evidenced by their clothing. Either they're showing more flesh or they begin wearing outfits that the Lord would deem inappropriate. 
It was in Genesis 38, I believe it was, where Tamar, it said, she was trying to entice Judah. And so what she did, she covered her face with a veil, so he didn't recognize her face. But then it says that she wrapped herself. She was wearing tight-fitting clothing so that he automatically assumed, or if I can see her body parts, I can see the silhouette, she's, I, she's selling something here. Look what it says in verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? We get into it that Adam uh, tells on himself that now he has the knowledge of good and evil. Before he had the knowledge of good, but not of evil. He recognized once he see, he's a sinner, he, sin and nakedness go hand in hand everywhere in the Bible. And God says, who told you that you were naked? Now here's the problem. They had on an apron and he knew he was still naked before God. And so God judged him. And eventually in verse 21, if you look at that, it says, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. Uh, this is your introduction to what clothing is. A coat will typically cover your arms and your body and your thigh and your knee. If you're not sure what nakedness is, according to the Bible, it's pretty much from the neck to the knee is counted as nakedness. If you would go to Exodus 32. Go to Exodus 32. You say, I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Well then please, please learn this lesson. God's giving us a warning that uh, in this world, in the basest, lowest form, when we go to the flesh, it's adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lasciviousness. It's all manner of perversion. Some people do it, so, um, you know, they have a problem with the lust of the eyes. Others have a problem with the pride of life where they dress, where they wrap themselves so everybody can see their body so they can show off. I understand we live in Florida, but we're God's children. We're God's children. And He wants you to have the fruit of the Spirit. He wants you to grow spiritually. You shouldn't look like the children of the world. I know that we're all at different points of growing in our life. I understand that. I don't think everybody should come here looking the same. But what I want to encourage you in this is have you ever been out in public and somebody just knew that you were one of God's children by how that you were dressed? It happens. It's happened many times to my wife. Oh, where do you go to church? Do you make a habit of just randomly asking everybody in the grocery store, where do you go to church? Meh, not really. It happens more often than not. In Exodus chapter 32, I want you to see this. This is such an important and a powerful lesson about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, look at verse number 22. They did this great sin, right? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go down before us. And as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, and then he gets really angry here. The Lord is angry. Nakedness is associated with shame. We're not supposed to shame ourselves by demonstrating our nakedness in public. If you would, go to Luke chapter 8. Go to Luke chapter number 8. My prayer is that you would see, here's how we don't want to do it, <laughs> so I better do it God's way and make sure that I have God's blessing on my life. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Do you want spiritual growth? Then I would encourage you to do things God's way. We cannot support evil, and we should not be party to it as well. The problem is we're all in a fallen state. We're all sinners. 
There are many people that are growing at different rates. And there are Christians sitting in here today that if you ask them, they say, well, two years ago, I wore stuff I wouldn't wear today. I would say, you're probably getting closer to the Lord. And there are other Christians that say, well, two years ago, I dressed like this. Now I feel free. I can do whatever I want. And it's like, well, are you getting closer to the Lord or farther away from the Lord? In Luke chapter 8, I want to show you this of uh, the man that was possessed with many devils. And God came and uh, look at verse number uh, 27. Luke 8, verse 27, And when he went forth to the land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Right? So he's out in the tombs, cutting himself. He's possessed. He's a wild man. Nobody can get near him, but he's known by his nakedness because he's possessed with many devils. Would you say he's close to God or would you say he's kind of far away from God? Far away. Well, Jesus steps in. Boy, and praise the Lord for that. He comes and helps all of us when we call on Him. Look at verse 35. Then when they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed, and in his right mind, they were afraid. They knew who this guy was. Uh, they were all of a sudden, it's like, now he's, uh, would you call sitting at the feet of Jesus, would you call that close to God? And you notice he says he's clothed. This is a concept we find throughout the whole Bible that people will shame themselves by exposing their nakedness for attention. It will also cause others to fall into sin. And sometimes that sin is on two parties. It's important that we make sure that we walk in the Spirit of, the God, of God and not give in to the lust of the flesh. If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 9. I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 7. Go to Proverbs chapter 7. The Bible warns in Matthew that if a man looks upon a woman and lusts after her, he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. God tells the man, be careful what you look at because you're guilty of adultery. He says the same thing in Job 31. He says, I've made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I want you to understand that the genders are different. Amen? Man and women are different. God made them different. And God says, men, get control of your eyes and your mind. Don't look in lust. You've made a covenant with your eyes. You've promised you, you're to one woman and you're going to stay with her. Don't break that covenant. Well, the thing with the women is God often tells them, watch how you dress. Because there's another type of woman that intentionally dresses the wrong way to hurt men. And it's a sin against God. Look at Proverbs chapter 7. Uh, look at verse number 10, this is a young man going after a strange woman, it says, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. Now, does it say that she was a harlot? A harlot is a whore. Does it say she was a harlot or that she just had the attire of an harlot? She had the intentions, I'm going to show you this, she had the intentions of a harlot, so she, de she showed off her body in a way to grab somebody to steal their attention. Doesn't it tell us in Proverbs that the adulteress will hunt for the precious life? She is loud, verse 11, look at it. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn and her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets and lieth and way to every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. I have found thee. I have decked my bed. We'll stop there for a second. What, what's she doing? She shows off her body and she says, I'm looking for somebody to commit adultery with. And so I'm showing you my body as an advertisement, the attire of an harlot, she says. I want you to see something in verse 13 that's super important. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face. You know what impudent means? It means hard-faced, but it also means shameless. A shameless face. You understand, sometimes people have a shameless look when they're ready to commit sin. If you've ever seen somebody that wants to go out drinking all night and they're, they're just bold-faced, 
This is what we're going to do. We're, we're mighty to drink mixed wine, as it says. A very dangerous attitude with the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter, or 1 Timothy 2, rather. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I tell you these things because I love you. Not because I expect everybody to have my standard, but because God does have a standard for our body. It is His temple. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, and here comes summertime, and when you take your shirt off, the Bible calls it nakedness, whether you're a man or a woman. Period. I, I mentioned earlier, it was in the bulletin, we're having our uh, church picnic day. There's a pool there. We have standards. You cannot show up in a bikini. If you show up in a bikini, I'm going to send you home. <laughs> you, you can wear shorts and a t-shirt, and that goes for everybody. There are swim dresses. There are many ways to be appropriate in what you do because women and men are different, and mixed swimming with people that are naked is a sin, according to the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, I want you to see this. This is God's will. Look at verse number 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Do you see what that says there? Modest apparel. That means clothing that is modest. Clothing, there is clothing that is immodest. It is designed to show off your body. Here it says wear modest apparel. Let me say it to you this way. Uh, young ladies, if you are not married, you preserve what you have for the husband that God may have for you. You keep yourself pure. Don't share it with the world. Don't share it with anybody else. There are certain things when you put it on, you say, if this is the temple of God, I'm going to look in the mirror and I'm going to make sure that if I have to move or do something, that all of a sudden I don't become immodest or inappropriate and sin against the Lord. Is this too tight? Is it showing off my body? Am I wearing this because I know that people are going to look at my body? He says, wear modest apparel. But then look what it says, with shamefacedness. Isn't it interesting? We saw the one with the attire of a harlot. It said that she was shameless. An impudent, hard face. Here it says, shamefacedness. Shamefacedness means you're not looking for trouble. It means when somebody's looking at you inappropriately, you kind of, you get out of there. You're like, I'm out of here. I'm not interested. This is why we have rules in the church. Uh, you know, we don't want people in the other building unsupervised. We don't want, uh, you know, two children off on their own in a room. We want an adult present. We want three or four together. You know, I want to protect the children. I want to make sure that nobody gets hurt in this church. And at the same time, I want you to help me to do your part, whether it's as a husband or a wife or a child or a single, that you're going to protect the body that God has given you so that it does not become a stumbling block to somebody else. He says, modest apparel, shamefacedness, and sobriety, not with broided hair, golds, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. He says, you ought to look like a godly woman. This doesn't mean wearing earrings is a sin, or even wearing gold is a sin. But every one of you knows of someone that, I mean, it must take them four hours in the morning to paint their face, doesn't it? And to put all that stuff on, and it's like, they're so fake. They're so focused on the flesh. I've been in churches where they say makeup's a sin, and I've been in churches where they condemn you if you try to say that it's a sin. I mean, that's between you and the Lord. But is that all you're focused on, is what other, getting people's attention to your body, to your flesh? Makeup is not inherently a sin. Jewelry is not inherently a sin. A, a, a wardrobe, an outfit, a shirt is not inherently a sin. But if it belongs to your spouse, you should keep it covered up and keep it just for your spouse. Go back to Galatians chapter 5. I want you to get this. Galatians chapter 5. God's will is that you would get the fruit of the Spirit. He gives us this awesome statement, and many of you may already have it memorized, and you know what they are, and many of you may already have many aspects of this, but I want to, I want to first show you how to have inward success. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. This is inside of you. This is something that you can do. 
Well, he says in John 15, or 13 rather, he says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Love, joy, peace. He says in John, I think it's 16, that he's, no, 15, he says that uh, my peace I give unto you, right? He also says, no man taketh your joy. God wants you to have such joy and such peace and such love. And here's the problem. And here's, here's where we're going to have a real clear dividing line here. Um, when you see your brother sin a sin that is not unto death, we should pray for them. There are sins that are called a sin unto death. He says, don't pray for it. God's going to smite them. When we, and as the mature Christians, see somebody else that's struggling, like with a wardrobe problem, do you lose your love? Do you lose your joy? Or do you lose your peace? If so, you need to mature. There's a, uh, there's a guy at Costco. He, he visits the church here, here and there and um, with his family. And uh, one time I was talking to him and I, I gave him a, oh, you got one of those invites? You got an extra? Yeah, man, here, I'll give you another one. And he says, here, give it. And he turns to a lady born as a woman that has chosen to designate herself in a totally different way. Here, you can come too. And I'm like, well, I, uh, uh, you know, like, <laughs> well, this got awkward. But then it hit me. You know what? If I have the love of God, and I have the joy of the Lord, which is my strength, and I have peace that no man can take from me, when I'm confronted with such a person that's such an grievous sin that God calls an abomination, it shouldn't cause me to lose my love, joy, or peace. Do you understand that that person, when God looks at them, He says, I made that soul. And I want that soul to go and be with me, but they're making other choices. They're going another way. They're, they're hating me and going away from me. Many of us know people where, oh, I, you know, I've got people in my family, my wife does in hers, and I'm sure you do in yours, where it's like, I remember them from a child when they grew up and a baby, and then I don't know what happened. They went from being smart and sweet to all of a sudden, like, I mean, they dress in black and wear black makeup, and they, they seem like, like a little antichrist. Like, what in the world is happening to some of the children these days? When Hollywood gets in their heart and the devil's song gets in their ear and they tell them what to do and what to say and what to be. It's sad and it breaks my heart that there are certain people in my family that it almost feels like they're a lost cause. And yet the Lord looks at them and He says, I made that soul and I loved them enough that I died for their sin. Guys, I want you to understand if we're going to be the mature Christian and grow, that love joy and peace. We can't lose it for anything. When you're confronted with outright sin that makes you feel uncomfortable, I want you to know you have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We keep our cool and we minister to them. There are those that oppose themselves that we've been called to help. Love, joy, peace. This is inward success. Inside, inward now let's talk about outward. How can the fruit of the Spirit in my life be displayed to y'all, to others? My family, my friends, my co-workers, my church members, outward. Well, he says, long-suffering. That's a long word. You know what that means? God puts up with our stuff for a long time. How many times has God looked down at you and He's like, oh, there He goes again. <laughs> Boy, if I didn't love Him, I'd probably just crush Him, you know what I mean? Like, let's give Him some patience and be merciful right now. I'm still going to draw Him and I'm probably going to whoop Him and correct Him because I'm long-suffering. That means He puts up with your stuff for a long time. He sees who you are. He knows your weakness and your problem. And He still loves you. If we could be more like God, we would be able to do the same thing with our friends and maybe even our enemies. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We, we don't get offended at the enemies. Hey, we can even have peace with our enemies when we know that we're walking with the Lord. He says, long-suffering. We should be treating others. For outward success, we need to treat others with long-suffering and gentleness. And gentleness. Paul says it more than one time that I was gentle among you. 
And other times he says, I'm preaching pretty bold to you right now. You guys better get it right or I'm going to come and I'll show you what's up. You know, like when he's trying to set some of these churches that were living in open sin, he's trying to put them in order. Would it be said of you that how you treat other people is long-suffering and gentle, meaning kind, goodness, that the things that you do for others, we can see the love of God that's already in you coming out of you as you do good things for other people. And doesn't he say in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, hypocritical Christians are a dime a dozen. I don't want to be one. I want it to be said that people will say, yeah, I've met some guys, but you know, they, he actually was walking what he was talking. Isn't that how it ought to be? Inward success, love, joy, peace. Outward success, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Godward. God, I want some success toward God. How do I do that? Faith, meekness, temperance we are saved through faith it says in ephesians chapter 2 you have the ability to have faith god has given you a measure of faith if i could give you an illustration i have a measure of water and if i had two glasses i could pour it in one that said self or i could pour it in one that says god or god forbid you could pour it in one that says Baal or man-made doctrine, or Catholicism, or the tra tradition of my fathers. God made you with the ability to trust, the ability to believe. And with that, I choose to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm saved not because of what I have done, because He finished the work. He tells me to cease from my works and enter into His rest, right? The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I have put my faith in Him. He made a promise. I want the gift of God. So I'm saved by faith. But then, you know, in 2 Peter 1, he says, add to your faith. There was the man needing healing, and he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. The disciples came and said, Lord, increase our faith. You understand we're saved by faith, but now we need to walk by faith. You know what that means? We, since we've been married, we've had to make some very difficult decisions on certain things in our life and it's like this is how we've done it and this is what we know and I know this will work but I want to be right with God and so we're gonna go in this direction and you can call it a blind leap of faith but I just trust that the Lord is gonna provide and bless and take care of me making the right decision sometimes we have to take a step away from what we're doing in our own wisdom I know what to do if I'll put this in order and buy one of those and set that up I'll be a millionaire and God says, forget all that stuff. I want you to walk by faith and just trust me and do the right thing and get away from what's holding you back and move toward me and you'll have a great blessing. Brother Chad just started a business. Making a good money at a good job. The environment's changing. There's problems with the co-workers. The work is good and he's highly skilled. And he came to a point and said, you know what? It's not just the environment. It's not just the work. It's, it's that I don't get to spend time with my sons. I want to change my course and take a big leap of faith, trusting that God's going to provide in a supernatural way. And the result is I'll get to spend more time with my children. Then I'll have their heart and I'll just continue to guide them toward the Lord. Forget the benefits. Forget the corporation. They got more contacts and stuff. Who cares? I want the family. He made a big decision. That was a hard one. Sometimes to change careers is a big leap of faith, isn't it? Well, now listen, if you're saved by faith, it's time to grow up and walk by faith. Have faith toward God. Grow in how much you trust Him for. He says, faith, meekness, temperance. Faith, meekness, temperance. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is being a servant. Brother Chad preached in the family Sunday school hour about servanthood. Being like Jesus. Serving others. Sacrificing things. What a, what a great message he had. You know Moses, it was said that he was very meek more than anyone else on the earth. And God called him a great leader. He served as many people as he could 
even when it wore him out. And he was humble enough to receive advice. Hey, maybe we shouldn't do it this way. Maybe there's a better way. Moses understood he wasn't the end-all, be-all leader. He was following the leader. Moses was a great example. Faith, meekness, temperance. We'll stop right here with temperance. Guys, do you know what it means to temper something? I used to work in a, at a commercial storefront glazing company. I'd do building takeoffs and estimations for windows. They call it glazing. And I'd get a, a thing of drawings and I flip through it and I get to my section and I start making a list. I got a window opening here and it's three by six foot and I got this and it's got that. And a, a word, when I got into that industry, there was a word I learned, a phrase real quick. Tempered. Tempered glass. Tempered gr glass is also known as H.S. Lammy. I'm being a nerd. H.S. for heat strengthened and laminated. Now, actually, brother, brother Russell can probably testify to some of this that I'm talking about. He knows windows and glazing and, and tempering. Okay, so they take a regular piece of glass and they heat it up four times. And it's stronger four times. It comes out of the fire stronger than it went in. Then they put a piece of laminate over it. It's like plastic, basically, that holds it together, which is why you have safety glass in your windshield. If you were to get in a wreck and your face hit the windshield, God forbid, but the glass would shatter into a bunch of pieces because it's been tempered, and so it shatters instead of being one big piece that cuts off your neck. But then also that lamination, that, that layer of plastic protects your face, so it's like the windshield's busted, but not a scratch. How did that happen? They temper glass, they temper chocolate, they temper concrete, they temper steel, right, right? Tempered, it means strengthened, it means stronger than it came out, it means a few different things, held together a little better. In the Bible it would use that when speaking of taking fine flour tempered with oil and it became its own thing. They, be, because together they became stronger, just as God brings the church together. He says it is tempered. Temperance also has this indication of Self-control. Self-control. If you are temperate, you have self-control. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We should be temperate in all things. We should have self-control in our life. Listen, temperance means balanced. We should have the oil balancing the flour. We should be balanced Christians. We should be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. We shouldn't be weak and falling apart all the time, and we shouldn't just get emotional when anything bad happens or somebody rebukes us or it comes at us like, Lord, I just want You to strengthen me. I want You to make me stronger. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse number 23 with me. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 23, the Word of the Lord says, And this I do for the Gospel's sake, that I might be partaker with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Listen here. You're running your own race in life. You have your own course to fulfill. God has a will for you. Will you submit to His will and run that race and say, God has a finish line for me and I know what it looks like. I'm going to find it at all costs. He's saying to run your own race. Don't be lackadaisical and slothful and give up and say, what's the point? Uh, don't be caught up in adultery and fornication and drunkenness and lasciviousness and all the things, the cares of the world, that keep Christians from being successful. Be willing to let the Holy Spirit get a hold of you and help you grow. Let some of the fruit of the Spirit come out of your life as you get victories First on the inside, inward, love, joy, peace. Then it comes out, it exudes, and you begin to see the fruit of the Spirit toward others, outward, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. Finally, our growth is measured toward God in our faith toward Him, our meekness as we're humble before the Lord. But then our temperance in life, because when we walk with the Lord, we know He's with us and He sees everything. Many times the children will not sin as greatly when mom and dad's in front of them. But they get around the corner and boy, ooh, they're quick to get in trouble. Right? I heard what you said in there. My mom used to say, we'd be in there playing or do something. And she'd, and she'd say, call from the other room. And it's like, how did you know that? And she, she had us convinced she had eyes in the back of her head. That's what she would say. 
I think it's called mom's intuition. It's that spiritual discernment. Like, I hear what they're saying. We have one, and, and my wife and I, it's like, oh, so-and-so has been quiet for like three minutes. We need to go check on them. You know what I mean? Anybody have one of those kids? <laughs> Amen, yeah. <laughs> well, God wants us to grow in the Spirit, to have the fruit of the Spirit, and this final thing he says is temperance. Against such there is no law. What does it mean to be temperate? Well, it means steady, always the same. Not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Not your whole day's ruined because you ran into somebody and they were in sin and then it caused you to lose your joy and now you're in sin. He says in verse 25, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. You guys understand, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and you will be rewarded with what you did in your body. So don't use your body as a sinful mechanism that the devil can get a hold of you and ruin your life or cause others to stumble. No, no, no. Bring it as a living sacrifice. Put it on the altar every day. Die daily to yourself and live for God. He says, you want to be a mastery? You know, mastery is like mastering the race. You want it to be said when you get before the Lord, He's like, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, and then maybe He'll look at you and say, you know, you hit the 90 percentile, whereas most Christians are in the 20 percentile. Wouldn't that be awesome? I was speaking with a brother this week. He's out of town. We're talking about some stuff. And he's like, man, times are getting weirder, days are short, you know, the Antichrist king, like we're talking about, he's like, he says, I, I'm just going to live for God, and I'm going to preach the gospel, and he said, I want to be one of the 144,000, and I said, why would you sell yourself short, don't you want to be one of the 24 elders, I mean, like, if you're going to do it, you know what I mean, let's, let's go all out and live for the Lord, right, <laughs> we ought to do everything we can to master our course for the Lord, let's run for the Lord. But to do that, he says, if you look at it, he says, you must be temperate in all things. I'll tell you what, when it comes to dieting, I'm the best. I've mastered it. No, I, I don't care what, I don't eat that and I don't touch this. It, ooh, is that a Reese's? <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, that means you're, you're temperate in some, most things. But boy, when it comes to Reese's cups, who has a weakness for, for peanut butter and chocolate? Yeah, amen. I, I appreciate your honesty. Amen. Yeah, me too. You can bring... No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. All right. Let's finish this. Look, verse 25, it says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly. Like, I'm all over the place. I know where I'm going. I'm on target. Not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That word castaway is very heavy. I could name names of friends that are saved, that have lived for God, that have preached the gospel and seen others save, that they have a high standard for the Lord. But they used their body, or I should say they let the devil use their body, and it ruined their life and they're off course. There are born-again believers today that are not in church because they started down the path of lasciviousness and fornication and adultery and nakedness and shame and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And God said, no, get back on the course. The finish line is still there and you're all over the place. God forbid that we would be a castaway. Instead of being rejected, let's keep under our body and not let our body keep us under. Don't let your body push down your spirit. You let the Spirit of God work through you, and you reject the desires of the flesh to show off your flesh, or to stare at other flesh, and you give God the glory. God wants to use us for a mighty work, and the devil knows exactly how to distract us, doesn't he? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and Lord, I do pray that these verses would just go into our heart and Change us, Lord. I, I just pray that your word would change us and help us to become more like you, be conformed to the image 
one day we'll be like you in the resurrection. And until then, Lord, I pray you would help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you. Lord, I love you so much. I ask you to keep us safe as we leave here. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to have the fruit of the Spirit in our heart toward each other and toward you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.